from Studio D. Welcome to Dove Point Bible Study. And we're so glad you joined us. Today we begin a brand, we begin a brand new chapter in the book of Genesis, chapter 3. Before we start, let's recap some of what we have learned from our last lecture as we finished chapter 2, where we were introduced to the Garden of Eden, and up to this point you haven't heard the word apple used one time. Nor will you in chapter 3, because it is not the kind of tree God wants you to be aware of. In chapter 3, God is going to give us a little education on the different kinds of trees that will explain exactly what really happened in the Garden of Eden. So in order to understand what actually happened, let us not bend or change what God's Word says. And let's be sure and document what it says. And let us not worry about what men say. Let us not worry about that at all. And, let, <clears throat> and let's just stick to the Word Stick to what the manuscripts tell us because when you do that, you will not and you cannot be deceived. Okay? So from chapter 2, remember this. The creations of the sixth day man and then Etha Adam who was formed after the seventh day of rest and then God created certain domestic animals and then God created Adam's wife, Eve. That was the order that we finished last time. So I'm going to start with the last verse in chapter 2, which is verse 25, speaking of Adam and Eve, and it reads, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. And why were they not ashamed? They were not ashamed because they hadn't sinned yet. And sin always brings shame, and shame's favorite game is to hide and to cover things up. That brings us to where we left off last time, chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent was more subtle. Now that word subtle in the Greek, I'm sorry, in the Hebrew, I'm taking you back to the manuscripts, is arum. Now the, and which means he was more cunning and he was more crafty. So now the serpent was more subtle than any other beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea! Hath God said you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? Now, if you remember from last week in chapter 2, 16 and 17, God had already told Adam and Eve that they could eat of every tree of the garden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And this was God's order. And when God <clears throat> says a thing, okay, it becomes law. That's what he told him, And this is how Satan works. He is continually quoting God's Word. He doesn't run from God's Word. He quotes it, but always with just a little twist on it. He's that slick. Verse 2, And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Verse 3, But of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. You've got your Bibles open. You need to underline the word touch. Okay? I'm going to read it again. <clears throat> but of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But which tree in the midst of the garden was it? Because from Genesis 2, 9, we read it last time, we found out that there were two trees in the midst of the garden. Tree number one is the tree of life, which is Jesus Christ, which you can find in Revelation chapter 22. The whole, the whole chapter 22 of Revelation is all about Jesus Christ being the tree of life. <clears throat> and tree number two is the tree of the knowledge of both good and evil which is making direct reference to Satan. <clears throat> For at one time, he was good, and he knew good. But now, he's evil, and unfortunately, he did not, she did not, he, I'm sorry, unfortunately, Eve did not have the opportunity to go to the tree of life first. And that's a sad situation. So, think about this. 
if touching the wrong tree makes you die, then we need to find out what the word touch means in the Hebrew language. Okay, does that make sense? Also, you need to know that many times our Father uses symbology and euphemisms to teach on a much deeper level. One of the reasons for this is to protect little ears until they are old enough and mature enough to understand. And many times these deeper truths are locked up in the meanings of the Hebrew and the Greek words themselves. But with a strong concordance. If you don't have one, you need one. And an authorized King James Bible. Not a New International, not any of the other versions. They're okay. <clears throat> but if you want to get back to the manuscripts, you need an authorized King James Bible and a strong concordance. And if you've got those two, two, two tools, anyone can unlock the meanings with very little effort of every single word in your Bible that goes back to those manuscripts. And quite frankly, if you're not being taught the manuscripts, you're wasting your time. Because you're not going to get the full understanding on anything. You're going to get part of it, and then you're going to get off into fairy tales and traditions of man and stuff that people make up. But if you stick to those manuscripts, I mean stick to them, you will not be fooled. You will not be deceived. Does that make sense? In Genesis, in, <clears throat> in Genesis 3.3, you find out that the truth is locked up in the word touch. Okay? If you touch it, you shall die. And the word touch in your Strong's is number 5060. All right? 5060. And the word is naga. Say naga. And naga is a primitive root. Here's Strong's definition of it. Naga is a primitive root meaning to touch or to lay the hand upon for any purpose. And Naga is also a euphemism, I'm continuing with Strong's, meaning to lie with a woman. And a euphemism is a word softener. Okay? In other words, it's nicer to say touch, alright, rather than to say intercourse, which is what it means. <clears throat> so get a Strong's concordance and look it up for yourself it's not that hard to do. And when you do that, that's documentation. Okay? You can prove what you're talking about. Verse 4. <clears throat> and the serpent <clears throat> excuse me, said unto the woman, You shall not surely die. And here he goes again. His lips are moving, so you know he's lying. But God had said, You will die if you touch, if you naga that tree. It's over with. And right here, this is what life narrows down to in general. If you think about this, which one are you going to believe with the free will that God has given you? What Satan says or what God says? That's what it boils down to. Satan is the one who brought death into this world. But Eve, by not being obedient to God, as well as Adam, did bring death into the world through Satan. Okay? And for, the sec for a second witness on the, all this from the Old Testament, I want you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Keep your finger there in Genesis. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. In the New Testament, where the Apostle Paul <coughs> excuse me, is writing to the Corinthians. Are you there? I'll give you a little time to get there in your Bibles. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. Paul's going to bring the garden experience up. Paul writing to the Corinthians, and in verse 2, and it reads, he says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you. Espoused means engaged. To one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, in a spiritual sense right here, absolutely. This is in a spiritual sense. Listen closely to number three though. He continues. But, Paul said, I fear 
lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. And this word beguiled in the Greek language, going back to Strong's, is expatio. Meaning, to wholly seduce or to seduce completely and it does not have any other meaning. You with me? <clears throat> but even then, even when you read these, even then some people are so sheltered, and I'm talking about church folks, okay, that they will say, oh, that was certainly all just spiritual there. No, it isn't. It is not. It is simply, think about it, here's what Paul's doing. It is simply using an actual event, going back to the garden, so that 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 is spiritual to you can be brought to pass in your life before the Antichrist arrives without causing you to be with not be deceived or seduced by him spiritually. Does that make sense? So that you're not deceived by him when he arrives. Because when he arrives, he's coming as Christ. Okay? In other words, what Paul is saying is, this is a physical experience from the past in the garden that points to a spiritual example that's going to happen in your and I generation. He beguiled that woman in the flesh. He's going to beguile people in the spirit. So Paul's making that connection. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> we'll pick it up where we left off in verse 5. As Satan continues to talk to Eve, and he says, For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes will be opened, and you shall be as gods. Look at that. Small g. Not capital G. You shall be as gods knowing good and evil. In other words, Satan is telling her, you'll be just like us, the angelic beings, and you'll know good from evil. Which is huge because at this point, all right, Eve was created innocent and she still is innocent right here, even after he says this. Now, I'm going to shift gears here for a moment. In your Bible, it is not unusual for God to refer to men, to angels, and to the Messiah Himself as trees. In Isaiah 61 verse 3, God calls us His children, the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. In Ezekiel 31 verses 3-15, through 15, God refers to Satan as the Assyrian who is like a cedar tree in Lebanon. And here God is using a tree to describe the beauty of Lucifer in that age that it was when He first made, created him. And then in verse 9, God says about Lucifer, I have made him fair by the multitude of his branches so that all the trees of Eden that were in the garden of God envied him. That's pretty direct. Then in verse 15, it describes Lucifer's fall. And God said, I caused Lebanon to mourn for him, and all the trees of the field fainted for him. And after his fall, he was no longer called Lucifer, which means light bearer or light bringer. Now he's called Satan, which means adversary. Also, these four great major prophets of God in Isaiah 11, verse 1, Jeremiah 23, verse 5, Ezekiel 17, verse 22, and Zechariah 6, verse 12, all these prophets gave prophecies of the coming Messiah, all of them calling Him the righteous branch. Even today, what do we call our torso? We call it our trunk. What do we call our arms and our legs? We call them our limbs. Still carries on today. And so Satan is lying to Eve here. And what he really knows is this. 
He knows that the moment He touches her, you get the point? This no good fallen tree, it will close her spiritual eyes and open her eyes to the world and everything it demands. He knows that's going to happen. Now they already had the blessing from God. They had it made in that garden. And God told them, you don't do that or, that, or you lose all that. And that's just exactly what happened. And so, <clears throat> it puts what God said, if you don't obey what He said, it puts what He said in second place. And this is where we all get into trouble. Okay? So, question one more time. So far, in chapter 3, have you seen an apple mentioned? Okay. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6. And the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes. Now you can go back to Ezekiel 28 and verse 12. Ezekiel 28 will give you Satan's M.O. How God made him the, 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 the most beautiful creature that he ever made, blah, 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 and the whole nine yards. Ezekiel 28, 12 says, God said, I made you perfect in beauty. Well, he's still looking good right here. And he said, it was pleasant to the eyes to look at him. A tree to be desired to make one wise. Yeah, in the ways of the world. She took the fruit thereof, she touched it, Naga, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. So, they both partook of the same fruit. She simply directed him to it. And it's obvious from the manuscripts, and you'll see this in a minute, that it's talking about conception. Verse 7. The eyes of them both were opened. Open to sin. And they knew that they were naked. Now the last verse in chapter 2 said that they didn't even know they were naked. They weren't ashamed. But now they knew they're naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Okay? Aprons in the Hebrew, again, go back to Strong's, number 2290 is kagra. And it means a belt for the waist. Alright? So why did they make those aprons to put around their waist? They made the aprons to cover up their private parts because of what they had just done. Think about it. If eating an apple is what caused all the problems, then why didn't they cover up their mouths? One more question. Where were they standing when they made those aprons? In an apple orchard? No. They were obviously standing in a fig grove. Now for you deeper studiers, standing in a fig grove, okay, is quite interesting when you factor in Christ's parable of the fig tree in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 that He told us to learn. He told us to learn it. And what happened in the garden is the very foundation of the parable of the fig tree that Jesus said, if you don't understand this parable, then you won't understand any of the other parables. And you won't have spiritual eyes to see and spiritual ears to hear. So they made themselves aprons and they covered their nakedness. Verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord amongst the trees of the garden. Why? Well, because they'd sinned. They disobeyed God and they had lost their innocence. Verse 9. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou, Adam? Ten. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. Eleven. And he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee thou shouldest not eat? And we know he did because of his and her interactions with Satan. They were both ashamed. Twelve. And the man said, 
the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And I did eat. I'm sorry. She did it. He said, <laughs> blamed it on his wife. It's all her fault, even though it was Adam's responsibility. Okay, thirteen, the blame game, same old thing. And the Lord said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Ooh. If you eat, don't you partake? Certainly you do. The serpent beguiled me, and I did partake. And the word beguiled in the Hebrew is number 5377. And the word is nasha. And it means to seduce completely. And let's be clear about who this serpent is in the garden so there's no mistaking who it is. And you can find the answer in Revelation 12 and verse 9. And here it comes. The names of Satan. And the great dragon was cast out of heaven. That old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceiveth the whole world. It can't be any more plain than that. So, there you have it. That old serpent in the garden is none other than Satan, the devil. And now God's going to address Satan directly and lay out his future for him. Now, he's not going to like it, but that's too bad. Let's take a Lachim break, shall we? Lachim to life. God's going to lay out old Satan here in chapter 3 and verse 14. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Well, now that sounds like a snake. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what this is? This is a statement of degradation. He has just lost his rank. He was a high man. Satan, listen, Satan was superintendent over the first world age. I mean, he was, a, he was the top guy. He's just lost his rank. He's going to the bottom of the pile. And the bottom line is this. Satan will never, ever be able to attain forgiveness or salvation because of his actions. He's going to die. Period. Verse 15, God's still speaking to him. And He says, And I will put enmity, that's hostility and hatred, between, get this, thy seed, talking to the devil, your seed, Satan, and her seed. Between your seed, Satan, and her seed, Eve. That's what He said. And we're talking about children here because that is what the seed of man is, is it not? It's children. It's not hard to figure. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. In other words, the seed of woman is going to bruise the head of Satan, but Satan is going to bruise Christ's heel. And right here, Satan knew. Right here is when he knew that it would be from Eve that Christ would come. And what God is saying here. Because you have tried to destroy that, I will put enmity, hatred between your seed, Satan, and the woman's seed. Meaning Christ's heels would be bruised as Satan has him nailed to the cross. All right? But Christ will ultimately crush the head of the serpent. And so it is. Now, that hadn't happened yet. Having the nails healed, yeah, the, the heels nailed, I'm sorry. That's happened. But Satan, be, head being crushed by Christ, it hadn't happened yet. And the only reason I'm bringing this up is because Genesis is still, is still prophecy. Some of this is still prophecy for us today. It's going to happen. all right. And this prophecy is known as the very first messianic prophecy in your Bible. It's talking about Jesus Christ. Okay. So did Jesus teach that Satan would have children on this earth? He sure did. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 13. Leave your finger there or put a marker there in, in Genesis 
And let's shove over to Matthew chapter 13. And you're probably going to want to go back and listen to this lecture another time or two and study along in your Bible to get all this because I promise you, for most Christians, in most churches, this would be absolutely off limits to teach. But it's sad when you can't teach the true Word of God in a so-called house of worship. But we teach it right here. And I'm not ashamed of it, and neither are any of those that follow Dove Point, because it's the truth. That's the only reason. It's the truth. Okay, so we're in Matthew uh, chapter 13, where Christ is teaching the parable of the sower and the tares. And this is the parable that Christ said, if you don't understand this one, you can't understand the rest of them, which is the truth. And we'll pick it up in verse 37. When Christ's disciples ask Him, why are you talking to us in parables? And what is this parable of the sower in the garden? And so, from verse 37, I'm not going back to the parable. From verse 37, I'm going to go back to where He is explaining the parable to the disciples. And we'll pick it up in 37. Matthew 13, 37. He answered them and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. Now think about it. Who's the Son of Man? It's Jesus Christ. He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man. That means the Word of God, Jesus is the Word of God, the living Word of God, the Word of God was with God in the beginning, John chapter 1, when the Spirit moved and created the various races upon the earth. He was right there with Him. The good. The good seed. Okay? Six day man. All right? 38. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children or the conception of the wicked one. You do know uh, how children get here, right? It's through conception. You know? Let's read it again. The field is the world. The good seed are the children of the kingdom. But the tares are the children of the, or the conception of the wicked one. End of story. It's conception. 39. The enemy that sowed them is who? The devil. Does, do, does he say the serpent here? No, but he's talking about the same person. The one that sowed them is the devil. It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the serpent in the garden, that old dragon, the devil, and Satan that sowed that seed. Then Jesus said, the harvest is the end of the world and the reapers are the angels. And so we find out here that Christ did teach about the children of the serpent and why Adam and Eve uh, used fig leaves for an apron instead of a mask. Does that make sense? And now back to Genesis chapter 3 and we'll pick it back up in 16. I hope you're enjoying this. I hope it's enlightening to you. Genesis 3, verse 16. And God said unto the woman, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy what? Thy conception. Okay? And conception in the Hebrew language is heron. And it means pregnancy. And this is exactly what we're talking about all the way through here. To be with child. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over you. 17. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, it was, <clears throat> and think about this, it wasn't the fact that he was listening to his wife that got him in trouble. Rather, it was the fact that he wasn't listening to God. That's where he got in trouble. He said, That I commanded thee, <clears throat> thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. And man's been scratching and scrounging out a living ever since. It would have been real easy in that garden 
you're going to find out they're getting kicked out of the garden where briars and shrubs, uh, scrub brush rows and everything else you don't want. Verse 18, Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat of the herb of the field. 19, In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return to the ground, for out of it was thou taken. So, He's going to die. and he's going, He was formed from the dust of the earth. And he's going back to it. For dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. And that's the way it is. Okay, We're not here forever in the flesh. And it's a good thing. And many people believe. I'll just blow something out of the water here for, for some others. Many people still believe that God is going to raise those old flesh bodies back up. No, no, no. Dust it came out of. Dust it goes back to. That's where it stays. Okay? You're going to be raised up in a new spiritual body. You pass from this life, you're a Christian, a real one. You pass from this life, and you go on, you're going to go right back straight to the Father. The minute you're gone, you lay that flesh down, you've already picked up your new spiritual body. You've got it with you. And it's going to be like you looked when you were 25, 26 years old. It's not ever going to get sick. It won't ever die the whole nine yards. It's a really, really wonderful thing to think that God's going to go out in the cemetery and raise all that mess up. He ain't interested in that mess. And that is not going to happen. And the Word will prove it out. <clears throat> Verse 20, <clears throat> Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. Now right here, People can take this one verse. Well, as Adam and Eve started everything, they just started everything. Everybody descended from men. Well, we already know the sixth day man was created. All the races we created on the sixth day of creation, and they had 2,000 years to reproduce before Adam and Eve were ever formed in the garden. So you can't say, well, they all started from Adam and Eve because she was the mother of all living. And they take that, for she was the mother of all living. Okay, that has to be what it is. Wrong, because it don't match the rest of the Bible. She is the mother of all living for one reason and one reason only. Through Eve's womb, 75 generations down her family lineage would be born Jesus Christ, who they will call the second Adam, and you are either in Him or you aren't going to live very long. Okay? Therefore, Eve is the mother of all who live eternally. That's why she's the mother of all living. Does that make sense? Okay, verse 21. <clears throat> Unto Adam and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Now look, see, God had to go do something. All right? Here's a picture of redemption. It's an early picture of it, but it's an early picture of the cross too if you think about it. He had to go make coats of skins. All right? And right here you see a picture of that redemption that happened there and the one that's coming up. And because of sin, here's the way this works. Because of their sin, something had to die. In this case, it was an animal in order for something else to live. That's what all the sacrifices were for all through the Old Testament. We just finished the book of Hebrews. That's what all of that stuff was for. That bloodshed's got to happen. Okay? And there was bloodshed because of Adam and Eve's sin. 22. And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now, think about this now, He's going to protect him right here. And now, lest he put forth his hand and take, not touch, not naga, but take in the Hebrew, which means accept, like you accept Christ as your Savior. That's what take means. It's totally different than touch. And lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life, which we know as Jesus Christ, and eat, and live forever. In other words, he can't let him do that. In other words, if he was to partake of the word of salvation, the tree of life, at that time, and live forever before having earned the right to deserve 
salvation, that's not God's plan. And God wasn't going to have anything to do with that. He was actually protecting him. You're going to see how he does it here in the next verse or two. In other words, it's too late for that to go and run over and partake of that tree. Now Christ will have to pay the price on the cross. And now we've got to go through all of these thousands of years to get to there. You understand? <clears throat> verse 23, Therefore the Lord God sent Him forth from the Garden of Eden to till the ground from whence He was taken. He got shot out of the garden, right? He's still going to be a farmer. But now the ground He's going to work in is going to be rocky. It's going to have thorns in it. We just read it a while ago. <clears throat> it's going to be everything He doesn't want to like. He, everything He isn't going to want to like. Okay? And He's going to sweat by His brow. Verse 24, <clears throat> So He drove out the man and He placed at the Garden of Eden cherubims. These are, these are mighty guardian angels. And a flaming sword which turned every way. Okay? to keep the way of the tree of life. He was not going to get to that tree of life now. It's not, that's not good for him. Okay, And do you know what way this is talking about? This is Jesus Christ Himself, alright? This way. In John 14, <clears throat> in verse 5, when Thomas said to Jesus, Lord, we don't have any idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? That was his question. It's a good question. Verse 6, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and the resurrection. No man comes to the Father but by me. 7, If you had known me, he said, you should have known my Father also. And from henceforth, you do know him and have seen him, because Jesus is the way, that leads to eternal life. And He is an exact copy of His Father. When they were looking at Jesus, He was the express image of His Father. Amen. And if you want to have eternal life, listen close, then don't lie about God's Word. And maybe you're not lying on purpose, but don't be ignorant about it. Don't tell a bunch of people a bunch of stuff that you don't even know what you're talking about. I'm telling you, you do this <clears throat> and you're supposed to be a teacher or whatever and uh, people are following you and you're not getting back to these manuscripts and you're not bringing it forth like the Father left it to us, I'm telling you, you need to read Jeremiah 23. He's going to be really, really hard on those shepherds. They've not got a good day coming. Okay. <clears throat> so if you want to have eternal life, then don't lie about God's Word. Even if, I know some people that know it, they won't teach it. Okay? But, but teach it as it's written and teach it where anyone can understand it with gentleness and firmness from the manuscripts. And that's what I try to do. I don't think I'm, I don't think I'm too hard. If I am, I apologize. But if it got through, then that's okay too. <laughs> and you know what? Let me tell you this. Okay? You, you, parents, you be the judge of this. You know your children. There's nothing wrong with teaching a mature child's mind the truth. And I'll tell you this, and unless you do teach them the truth somewhere along the line before they get out on their own about how it was in the beginning and about what that parable of the sower means, then they will never fully understand the rest of God's Word because they can't. They might join a church. They might get into an organization. But they'll never fully understand it. You, mom and dad, got to put that foundation in them while they're at home. And when they understand how it was in the beginning, then they can begin to understand the controversy and the war we have between Satan and the seed of the woman, which is to say Christ and the children of God that try to follow God. Okay, And when we get to Genesis 6, Satan will make one more attempt to destroy that woman through which Christ would come. And it's, and it's a big one. You don't want to miss chapter 6 at all. And there's no reason. I want to finish with this. There's absolutely no reason. If I'm speaking to some 
teachers or maybe would be teachers or pastors there is no reason to apologize for what God's word says zero and it's so easy to check it out for yourself all you need is a Strong's and an authorized King James as I have demonstrated to you in this lecture God's word is true it's really simple and it's nothing but good it will bring you understanding it will bring you peace of mind and best of all it'll bring you eternal life friend and you never have to apologize for God's word to anyone for it is written and it shall come to pass exactly as it is written and whatever you do I'm finished with this one but whatever you do do not miss the next lecture in this great book of Genesis the book of the beginning because in chapter 4 you're going to find out that Eve's conceptions plural will result in the birth of two babies a set of twins one's name is Cain and his brother's name is Abel and though they are twins Cain's genealogy from chapter 4 which we'll cover next week is going to be different than Abel's genealogy found in chapter 5 and the manuscripts are very very clear on this and the reason that Cain is not mentioned in Adam's genealogy is very simple it's because he is not of Adam's genes and you'll see that in our next lecture so I hope you've enjoyed this and I hope you'll tell a friend about Dove Point and hit that subscribe button and hit like for us won't you do that we would appreciate it so from all of us here at Dove Point we honestly and truly thank you for watching until next time my friends Shalom and Shalom